I think of consciousness in terms of three problems. Two are um, sort of what I would regard as de uh, defining problems, even though I can't give you a definition. And then there's a meta problem between the two problems. Uh, first is the nature question, which is how is something like consciousness, which seems do not have any of the properties of all the things we seem to bump in in the universe. How is something like consciousness, how do, can it exist in this universe? Um, and, um, and there's various answers to that. Uh, and, and overlapping with that is how could it causally interact with the physical universe? So that's the nature question. Um, the fun function question is, given that so very much of our sophisticated, intelligent, complex behavior goes on without consciousness, what is consciousness's function? What does consciousness function to do? Uh, so this is the nature problem and the function problem. And then the meta question is, um, how are these two questions related? Yeah. Uh, should they be answered independently or should they be answered interdependently? And should you start from function and go to nature or start from nature and go to function, et cetera? And I would propose to you that the definitions of consciousness come out of answering those three definitional defining questions, I would put yeah. it. And so I think I, I, to claim that there's a definition of consciousness right now would be pretentious. I do think I could make a strong argument that all attempts uh, to define consciousness should address these three defining questions. And we could perhaps evaluate attempts to define consciousness in terms of how well they address these three questions. As a philosophical history of the mind-body problem, what have been the key takeaways throughout the years of philosophy that we have access to um, that you've noticed have been fundamental into framing this problem for you? So what's fundamental is um, I think we have forgotten that our current epistemological or even onto-epistemological framework um, what my friend Greg Enriquez calls the Enlightenment Gap, and he and I are writing a book on consciousness together right now. Nice. Um, um, uh, uh, we we forget that that is actually a historical invention that came out uh, through the Enlightenment, in which we think the world is exclusively dichotomized into a inner subjective realm and an outer objective realm, and this is grounded in a substance ontology, in which there. Reality is ultimately grounded in sort of uh, th things, uh, spatial temporal things uh, that can exist to some degree of significant independence. And when we, what substance is from the inside is subjectivity, what it is from the outside is objectivity. And the thing to remember is, of course, that way of carving up the world is not by any means universal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not even uh, universal in our own history. You go before the Cartesian Revolution, you have, you know, in the Middle Ages, something like a heliomorphism, although there's a lot of Neoplatonism in there. You go back earlier um, and you have a Neoplatonic framework in which the problem isn't between the subjective and the objective. The crucial problem they're wrestling with is the problem of the one and the many. How can being be simultaneously one and many? And then they try to unpack um, the nature of cognition, the nature of knowing, and the nature of experience within trying to address that question. And we sort of do the reverse. Um, and we think that is um, how it has to be. Um, and then, of course, part and parcel of that is Descartes also gave us not only that dichotomy and competing notions of real. We have these two competing notions of what realness is. One is sort of mathematically measurable, and the other one is most subjectively experienced. So, of course, the cogito, I, I am that I, you know, I, I think therefore I am, versus the mathematical measurements of matter, et cetera. Um, but in addition to that, Descartes gave us the proposal. He actually, Hobbes has it too, and but Descartes, and so Descartes and Hobbes together, uh, that cognition is computation. And then Hobbes, of course, uh, came up with that idea with the idea, well, we could get a completely automatic material machine that could compute, and then that would give us cognition, mind. Um, he didn't say much about consciousness, but I assumed uh, many people have gone on to think, well, maybe if we get artificial intelligence, and many people are talking this way right now with the LLMs, then we'll just get uh, consciousness coming along for the ride. So, sorry, that was a, a bit of a speech, but that's sort of uh, the grammar, the cultural cognitive grammar within which I think we're working.
again, with that, it's it's quite difficult to distinctly draw lines between what is conscious, what isn't. Yes. Where do you find yourself on the spectrum? Do you see this thing as a continuum? Or or are you finding this to be quite difficult to even say is a... Um, so, um, uh, uh, my, what, what I argue for, I want to be really careful here because this is like next to God, this is the hardest philosophical problem, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I do not want to come off as pretentious. I'm answering your questions as honestly as I can, mm -hmm. given the best arguments I have formulated in terms of looking at other people's arguments and evidence. And I want it understood that is that is my stance. Now, John Verveke is not pronouncing on this phenomenon. Um, <laughs> I hope it doesn't come off that way, because that is not my intent. Um, for me, I think... Um, you can answer the nature and function questions together in an interdependent fashion uh, by seeing how they both are explainable in terms of relevance realization. Mm -hmm. And then I think relevance realization is ultimately grounded in autopoiesis. Uh, and um, I think that means that general intelligence, general artificial intelligence requires something like artificial autopoiesis to ground it. And there's deep reasons for that. This is, I think, how you get a, a lot of the central properties you need for uh, bona fide uh, intelligent cognition. And then I happen to argue that I think the function of uh, consciousness is to give us a higher order recursive correction on our relevance realization machinery, basically going on in uh, working memory. Mm -hmm. And that is an enhancement uh, uh, of our intelligence uh, so that it's sort of bootstrapping it up so that it can deal with current problems that are high in novelty, high in complexity, and high in ill-definedness. Ill and this comes from the work of Bohr and Seth and Il Seth, of course, that we seem to be able to make things automatic and not requiring consciousness when these properties are lacking uh, for us. Pro a problem is not in the world or in you, it's between you and the world, right? Um, and so when uh, we can then ask, well, it seems to be we need consciousness when these properties are the case. And then I would argue those are just ex those are uh, sort of extreme, the stream pole of the whole relevance realization that intelligence is facing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, consciousness, therefore, shades off as we start to um move down our own cognition or move back through species where I'm using back in a very metaphorical sense. I don't think evolution is teleological or anything like that. And where we say like, as a worm, does a worm have intelligence and a worm have consciousness? And I point out to you that um, part of my, one of the advantages of my proposal, not an argument for it, but one of the powers of it is that it, it tends to explain why we carry this very deep intuition that we attribute consciousness to the degree and wherever we find intelligence. Um, and so typically the things that people doubt are conscious are things they equally doubt are intelligent. Um, and so I think cognition shades down and intelligence shades down and so consciousness shades down. I, that does not make me a panpsychic, maybe in a really, really weak way, uh, you know, something like a really watered down version of Whitehead's pan experientialism. I'm not sure about that, but I do think you, you drop because you drop out of relevance realization into just, um, sorry, I want to be very careful. Relevance realization and autopoiesis need each other. They're bound together, but you can drop below autopoiesis into merely self-organizing systems. And then I doubt that they have intelligence, even though there's a continuity between those self-organizing systems and autopoetic conscious agents. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, all of the, these answers are going to be all complex because, again, other than God, this is the hardest problem. <laughs> Paints a nice picture for people to understand. How are you and Greg approaching this book, upcoming book? Do, do you find that you're, you're using this cognitive science, the Cox, four E Cox revolution with psychological studies and philosophy, incorporating a multidisciplinary approach to your book of consciousness? Well, totally, totally. Um, and so uh, the book is based on some uh, some series on my channel, and the, uh, well, I think two of them also were on Greg's channel, uh, Untangling the World Knot, which was one we did on consciousness. And then uh, we did um, one on transcendent naturalism, 
Um, and then we also did one with Christopher Master Pietro, a dear friend of mine uh, and uh, co-author um, on the elusive eye, the nature and function of the self. And we've taken this all together. And Greg was basically doing work in which he was trying to solve what he calls the enlightenment gap, break out of this Cartesian grammar, but he was trying to do it uh, big picture. And he was trying to lay out what is the descriptive metaphysics in which we can recover um, the kind of worldview that will allow us to talk about this, the subjective and the objective worlds in a coherent, mutually supporting fashion, rather than this antagonistic, uh, mutually undermining. And then my arguments about transjectivity and relevance realization and my argument for transcendent naturalism, um, which is, I mean, I can't, I, 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 if you want, I can go into that, but there's a whole huge argument about oh, that. Uh, well, maybe, well, anyways, but the point is, I sort of laid out, a, this is why Greg describes it, I sort of laid out a, 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 a structure of mm -hmm. the overarching argument. He worked out the content, and then we're both using our interdisciplinary cog sci. Uh, him a little bit more emphasis in psychology, uh, psychology, therapeutic psychology, mine a little bit more emphasis in psychology, cognitive psychology, and philosophy, and machine learning. And we're bringing it all together. That's what's happening in the book. Any any running titles for that book, John? I know publishers often get involved with that, but uh, you find that you guys have settled. I don't know. We 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 were we were still playing with uh, you know using the title from the series, Untangling the World Knot which is a, a, a nice title for it, um, based on the Schopenhauer quote, uh, that the mind-body problem is the is the world not. Um, um, so uh, I don't know. I think we're sort of playing with that right now. Uh, what we're basically saying is um, our proposal with the idea of extended naturalism and transcendent naturalism is we can basically close the enlightenment gap. Mm -hmm. And then the division we make between adverbial... Uh, a quality and adjectival quality let us shrink the explanatory gap uh, uh of the hard problem and by collapsing the explanatory gap and shrinking the explanatory gap uh, sorry by 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 collapsing the enlightenment gap and shrinking uh the explanatory gap we can make a lot of progress towards the hard problem of consciousness mm -hmm.